السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته يا هلا ومرحبا فيكم بس حبيت أذكر بأسامي القاعات والمنتديات اللي يتم المناقشة فيها عندنا القاعة اللي إحنا فيها هي القاعة سي موضوع المنتدى فيها اللي هو الاستثمار والابتكار وعندنا القاعة A الموضوع فيها اللي هو التحول الرقمي والقاعة B اللي جنبنا هنا اللي هي الإعلان والإعلام أرحب فيكم مرة أخرى يا أهلا وسهلا فيكم جميعا بس حبيت أذكر التطبيق لعرب نت موجود على جميع الأجهزة في الآي او اس والأندرويد مجرد تكتبون عرب نت رياض 2017 الابليكيشن أو التطبيق راح يفيدكم في معرفة الجداول وجلسات الحوار اللي راح تكون في القاعات الثلاثة A, B و C وأذكركم برضو بتصويت المسابقات اللي كانت قبل البريك الغداء اللي هي مسابقة تحدي الشركات الناشئة والآي دي أثون التصويت على الموقع وتقدرون تحصلون الرابط عن طريق تويتر عرب نت وحبيت أذكر بعد أنه في قسم للنساء هنا في جلسة الإرشاد للنساء الآن والآن بنشغل فيديو بسيط تعريفي نشوف الفيديو مع بعض يعطيكم الف عافيه جميعا وفقا ل يعني دراسه قامت بها عرب نت انه في اكثر من اكثر من 150 جهه توفر التمويل في الشرق الاوسط وشمال افريقيا اليوم وقد تمت اكثر من 760 صفقه استثماريه بين سنه 2013 و2016 والحديث عن هذه المواضيع الان عندنا جلسه حوار تتكلم عن تقييم الشركات الناشئة من منظور رأس رأس المال المخاطر راح يكون محاور الجلسة هذه الأستاذ راكان العيدي 
ويعطيكم الف عافيه شكرا جزيلا السلام عليكم مساكم الله بالخير جميعا وشكرا على حضوركم وان شاء الله تكون جلسه جميله مع زملائي المتحاورين رحبوا معي بضيوف الجلسه الاخ صباح البن علي مستثمر وقائد ريادي حياك الله الاخ امجد احمد الفاوندر ومانجنج دايركت بارتنر فور بيرسيت بارتنرز And Mr. Zach Flinkstein from uh, the Vice President of Corporate Development in Karim. Uh, welcome, everyone. Just to kick off, this panel will be discussing how startup uh, valuations sh uh, uh, should be evaluated and what are the best practices and common pitfalls that startups face when raising capital and how founders optimize their business uh, to lower acquirers. Uh, we just saw the video and we just saw uh, the, uh, uh, also the report, the business intelligence report from ArabNet talking about uh, 150 entities that provide equity-based uh, funding. Ikhwan uh, al bab fadlu, fi maqa'ad hina, lo ngarrib shway, fi maqa'ad fi al-sayt al-amam. Uh, more than 760 investment transactions took place between 2013 and 2016 with an increasing maturity of the market and the startup and with the raise of a large uh, growth funds. Uh, MVB recently announced a $250 million fund. Uh, ST Ventures also announced double that with $500 million fund. And uh, Crescent Group also 150 and the region start to witness a valuation in the hundreds of million. Uh, are we, I think the number one question that everyone is asking, are we going into a VC bubble uh, very soon? Everyone is talking about too many funds and too big funds uh, coming into the region. Um, what's your thoughts on that? Um, <coughs> I'd, I'd say no, because there'll be a bubble if, they, if those funds actually were deploying money. And if you go ask any entrepreneurs here, I think they might uh, agree with me that they're not deploying a large uh, percentage of, of, these, uh, of these funds. <coughs> so there's, there's not a bubble, but there might be more of an awareness, which is why you're seeing the fund's ability to raise, to raise this much. So I don't think there's a bubble. We're nowhere near a bubble. We need to figure out bet more and better uh, effective ways to uh, fund our entrepreneurs and startups. So, so I think we should distinguish between marketing and reality first. Um, I think we saw the same thing happen uh, in private equity back in 2004, 2005. There were 150, 60 funds announced. Uh, very little of those funds exist today. And I think you'll have the same thing happening in venture. So that's number one. Uh, number two is, uh, as Sabah said, not many people are actually deploying capital. So I can tell you from our investment portfolio, uh, we have three companies right now that are doing um, sort of a series B, so more mature. Uh, a lot of the risk has already been taken out and they're struggling to raise 10, $15 million. So while you hear a lot about all of these uh, funds, there, there are not many people actually going ahead and taking risk. Um, so I think we need to be careful and scratch the surface and figure out what reality is versus, versus hype. The measure, the measure of success of a fund is not how much it raised, but how much it exited. Yeah. So I just wanted to add that. Okay. And I mean, look, I, I think there's, there's two ways to, to look at this. One <coughs> is when you see the power dynamics shifting to the entrepreneur, um, which is what we see in Silicon Valley, right? You know, slowly but surely, the, the best companies now have many VCs competing to invest, which means that there is an ability for the entrepreneur to, to name terms, keep more control of the company, and I think, consequently, 
actually really have a much more positive effect on their ability to grow and then you know, continue to be incentivized. So in theory, it's a good thing. I think in practice, we see the capital pouring into to pockets of the ecosystem in terms of what's being raised institutionally to focus on the Middle East. A lot of select companies around the Series A you know, may get you know, more capital uh, thrown at them than they need, more term sheets thrown at them than they need, but what tends to happen is once you get to the growth capital stage, you know, we talked about Series B companies, um, there's again a paucity of capital, and, and, and anecdotally, it still feels like there's a paucity of capital at the uh, seed and pre-seed stage as well. Zach, that's a very interesting point, the, the point of power. Who has the power today in 2017? I mean, I remember a couple of years ago, it used to be the VCs. And the entrepreneurs had to give away a lot of uh, uh, equity. Is that changing? It is changing. Um, it's changing, I think, for only a select group of startups right now. But there's a few that, for whatever reason, can now sort of be the, the hot ticket of the moment yeah. where a lot of people are chasing them, which would basically was the case for nobody a few years ago. Yeah. But you know, it does still feel like the power is still in the hands of the investors, um, you know, which, which really it does feel like that should shift, though. That, that is something that, that one would hope would change for everybody's sake, I think. Amjad, what's your thoughts? So I think it depends on the stage of development. Um, I think there's, there's a healthy amount in the Series A where once you've proven the model a bit, you have a bit of traction. Um, there are funds out there and liquidity enough for you to have some power, not, not tremendous power as, a, as an entrepreneur. I think the early stage and the later stage are, are difficult. Uh, so the power still rests with the investor. Um, but what you have today that I think you didn't have about four years ago is a discussion. Okay. So uh, four years ago, the investor would say, I think you're worth this. That's Take it. it or leave it, good luck. Yeah. Uh, today, I think there's more of a dialogue and because the entrepreneurs have a better sounding board, I think around the industry to understand their value. And, and I think this is an important note, by the way. A lot of entrepreneurs need to distinguish between their value and their price. There's a big difference. And your, your value is what intrinsically you believe your value is based on the data, based on the cash flow, based on the revenue multiples, whatever it is. The price is what the market is telling you you're worth. In an ideal world, those should be one, but it, it's, never really one. it's never really one and the same. So I think now the entrepreneurs are getting a little smarter about bringing those two together, where five years ago it was, it was a big, big gap. So, I, so <clears throat> my experience in venture capital investing was, started in 2000. The first investment was in, a, was in an IT solutions firm here in Saudi Arabia. And then we did Zawiya and we did a few others. And I really don't see much choice. I don't think that the, the question is power. I think the question, what I see, is confusion. So uh, investors don't know what to ask for and what it means, and entrepreneurs don't know what to ask for and what it means. <clears throat> and probably, as, as one ex example the, that, that is never spoken at, about out loud, is it's not just about price and valuation, it's about control of the company. So as a simple example, many of you might not know this. <clears throat> Put your phone away. <laughs> Many of you might not know this, but Bloomberg, the, the media company, is set up as a GPLP, right? So, so the owner, Michael Bloomberg, is the GP. Merrill Lynch and all these other banks are the LP. They don't have a say. Now, of course, that won't work here, but I think part of, of, of closing the gap between where or, or decreasing the confusion is, is, between, is, is, is to look at also the issues of control and governance and, and how to get that, because it's difficult you know, to, to convince an investor, come and take a minor, minority share, and the majority shareholder is also controls the board and is the management. So how do you solve that? So it's not just about, I think, uh, 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 valuation. That's a great uh, segue to our next comment, which is the, 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 the control of the company. Are we, is the region ready now for venture capital? I mean, I remember a couple of years ago as well that venture capital was a totally different new class of assets that no one was looking at it. And just 
talking to investors and saying, I want a million dollar for 5% or 10% of the company, they will laugh on you. And today, they're willing to sign that. So we're, we're going through a paradigm shift or a huge paradigm shift right now. And we're still having that difficulties. I mean, a current uh, case I came across is one of the investors called one of my investors, and he said, you, you are crazy to give him that valuation. So, uh, because he comes from a very traditional uh, uh, investment background. So are we able, um, I know there are a couple of new players, there are a couple of new good funds uh, that are trying to educate the market, and they're trying to build it up. But are we able to catch up? Is everyone going to eventually be interested in venture capital and accept it as a class of assets or investments? Yes. Well, you know, when, when you have oil, especially I'm talking about GCC, when you have oil go away and then and soon we'll see probably the monopolies, which are legislated profits for these family groups, go away. You're going to have to learn to take risk. Yeah. So the, the issue, I think, comes down to risk, which encompasses venture capital, but other investment asset classes. And, and, that, and that once the, 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 the easy return with the low risk, because of oil via government expenditure, or because of, of, of monopoly agencies, starts going away, you will have to learn how to how to uh, invest into riskier into what is considered normal risk around the world, but riskier around here. So I, th I think we're we're on a one-way path to 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 greater investment. Amjad. So so I view that question a little differently, which is, I think when we talk a lot about are we ready for venture risk, everyone asks the question sort of to individual investors. We, we sort of speak to individual investors rather than institutions. True. And I think we need to understand where venture capital usually comes from. And in more developed markets, it comes from institutional capital. So these are smart investors who know what they're getting into, they know how to calculate risk, and a lot of the money that goes to private equity and venture in the US and Europe comes from institutions. I think the bigger issue we have is our institutions yet have not sort of bought in to venture capital in the region. I think once they start allocating a decent amount of capital to this region in terms of giving it to managers who are doing good things, of course it all depends on whether managers are doing good returns or not, or the right things or not, I think that's when you'll see others follow. But the institutions have to start. So whether it's in Saudi, whether it's in Kuwait, whether it's in UAE, there has to be an allocated capital to managers locally so those managers can go out and invest in, in, in uh, small companies and, and venture companies. I mean, uh, you know, everybody here has sort of touched on uh, risk appetite. I think there's, there's something that you mentioned in the beginning, which is control. And I think sometimes I've seen investors say, okay, the valuation isn't that important for me. It's a question of can I get you know, a meaningful piece of ownership where I feel that I can then influence and, and control the company. And you know, a lot of that feels like it's coming from this position of lack of trust, right? And networks of trust are very important in emerging markets everywhere. That's not just true here in the GCC. Um, but they're established over many years of doing business together and, and, and sort of getting to know each other, and that doesn't work uh, for entrepreneurship because it moves too quickly. In Silicon Valley, I think what has started to happen is it's become such a lucrative place to do business and such an incredible place to do business that when I was doing venture capital there, um, there was base we did a surprising amount of business on Handshake because the assumption was that people cared so much about their reputation yeah. and about their ability to come back and do business in this unbelievable place that you have this certain implicit level of trust. So it's almost like when people see how valuable this ecosystem is, how important it is, how important reputation is, and understand that both from the investor and investee side, it enables people to take that risk of coming in as a minority investor with some protections, but albeit limited protections. Um, so I, I do think it's a question of, of uh, establishing the value of reputation and making sure everybody knows that both sides of the equation appreciate that. Yep. Do you think that, personally, do you think that we're gonna get there in 10 years, five years, 15 years? 
Gosh, I am, I am so the wrong person to ask that question. Um, I will just say, uh, inshallah, but, you know, other than, other than that, I think there's, yes, I think once you start to see, you know, exits and you start to see this snowball effect from, you know, a, a multitude of, of startups achieving a significant amount of success in this really, really attractive ecosystem where people can, you know, sort of uh, scale businesses, they can attract capital. I mean, this is where we're going, right? And people place value on reputation within that ecosystem. It inevitably happens. So yes, I am optimistic, but I I, I say I'm the wrong person to ask that okay. because you know most of my business career has been in the United States and just coming from a very different perspective institutionally and all that. Yes. So if you if you take Zach's point about trust, <clears throat> uh, it bifurcates for us. There's trust and integrity and trust and competence. I think the trust and integrity isn't that hard a hurdle to get over. It's the trust and competence. Most of our, we either have government or we have family groups. So the family groups are used to being in complete uh, control of the development process. And, and I think the trust and competence that, that, that individual entrepreneurs will take more and more successes and as they see the train leaving the station, they'll, uh, uh, they'll, 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 they'll move faster. Yeah, I mean, we start to have this, uh, especially here in Saudi, people start to care about their reputation when they're raising money, uh, and when also their reputation when venturing uh, new startups and companies. Uh, the reason why I ask you the question is, I believe we're getting there. Uh, we're a small region, uh, Dubai, Saudi, Lebanon, Kuwait. I mean, at the end, the, the market is mainly Saudi, with a little extension to Egypt, but I think we're getting there. I mean, if you look around the room, um, I can tell that we know most of the people here, or at least you know 10 of them, so we're not that big. We're, we're not as focused as the Silicon Valley, but I think we are focused region but that we can start to see that trust. But I think, look, I think this is a natural state of how this industry will develop, right? Because when, when you talk about doing deals with a handshake, it, you know, it's not that simple, right? These are guys who might have worked at Google, they might have worked at Facebook, they might have worked at very good places, so they have a track record, right? And I think you'll see that here. I think. You know, Souk is going to spawn out 20 guys who create companies. Yep. Kareem is going to spawn out 50 guys that create companies. That's a guy that's much easier for me to do business with. True. He's been through that cycle, right? So I think as we go on in, in our evolution, what you'll find is these great entrepreneurs who, who have already sort of done it yep. within a context of another startup. Yep. So it's much easier to trust them, right? And to say, you know, this guy was the you know, head he of knows technology. What he's doing, yeah? yeah, so. So I think that trust is, is built in as the track record develops. Yeah. I need two million for my company. <laughs> there you go. There you, go. <laughs> you guys need to IPO. <laughs> <laughs> you need to see more entrepreneurs. Um, steering to another topic, and I see a couple of entrepreneurs here in the room, so maybe we should open the subject of valuation, uh, which is the hot that's, topic. That's that <laughs> I mean, I've been in cases where I've seen fights between wow. entrepreneurs and investors. And I've seen all kind of uh, uh, bad words being said about some uh, institutional, even investors. Uh, I think since the industry is new, we're 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 basically changing the tire while the car is moving. So uh, I've seen cases where entrepreneurs went to online and they downloaded the term sheet from Silicon Valley and they throw it in the face of the investor and they said, "Hey, look, we are the entrepreneurs. We're the hot startup. Uh, you have to follow this." And then they. Investor did also sometimes the same thing. They, so are we going to solve this problem? Uh, is there a way to agree on a valuation method for the region that will be both sides happy, shake hands, and get the money and <laughs> scale the company? And I, can, I can give you from my experience. So one of our experiences <coughs> was when, when, when we bought Zawiya. So it was bankrupt. This is back in 2001. And and the founders are sitting there going, wait, this is actually worth a lot. You know, we, we don't want you to come in and take, we took 60%. We actually took more than 60%. And we said, well, we have the money, you don't, so tough luck. So, but, but how did we close the gap? We closed the gap by creating um, an LTIP. We're basically, we had a formula for how we were going to give them shares. 10% of the company was given to them over 18 months just to show up every day. So that was part of it. Part of it was on performance. So I think there are, there are different methods 
other than just you, you should only start here. You can end up with, with a very, very large shareholding. You can end up with, with control by, by, by looking at it in different ways. Uh, now, now, as Zach said, in, 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 in Silicon Valley, we shouldn't compare to that because there is, there is a, 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 almost a tradition, a culture that we don't have here yet. So, so the, you know, if you can find contractual ways where here is the value I'm creating, now give me my shares. I think that's that's certainly one option that 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 you can look at. I, I like that from your your experience, Amjad. Uh, one of your companies or something. Yeah, I mean, can look, you share with us? I think valuation is an art form, especially in the earlier stage. Um, it, it's a lot of relative valuation. You look at what other startups that similar in the sector have done. So I think what entrepreneurs need to realize, as well as investors, is there's a dance, right? Of how do we figure out the right formula? And I think as long as both parties are open-minded about how to get there, we found ways to get there. And I think, you know, uh, Sabah makes a great point, which is you got to be creative, right? You got to say, look, this is a lot of risk right now, but if it pays off, maybe you'll get some later or whatever it is. Um, but I think what's going to happen uh, is as liquidity increases in the region, you're gonna have valuations change. <laughs> because at the earlier stage, again, it's an art form. And I think when there are multiple parties pricing an asset, the entrepreneur is gonna benefit. Yeah. You know, there, there's gonna be sort of an escalation of pricing. Now, whether that ends up being good for returns or not, we, we'll have to see. But um, I, I think as the ecosystem develops in terms of buyers, um, or investors, then I think you'll see that pricing equation get better and better. But right now, if it's only, you know, if, if you're an entrepreneur and only talking to two parties, it's tough. Yeah. It's tough. You might have a big variation, right? Uh, if you're talking to 10, then? Then you get a little bit closer gap, are a right? Bit higher. Yeah, you, you start, what happens is the band starts getting a bit tighter, yeah. right? Yeah. So. Zach? You took my answer. <laughs> Um, no, all I, all I would add to, to um, what's been said so far, which is I think I agree strongly with, is that you know, there, there's, to your point, there's a lack of trust when there's not a, a lot of mechanisms for price discovery, you know, one or two term sheets, you know, who knows if that's the price, you know, the value should be valued at. And you end up in these, you know, sort of valuation negotiations, which are a lot of, no, trust me, my logic's right, trust me, my logic's right, and it's both parties are doing guesswork, so neither party is right. The more natural mechanism, you look at how it's more done in the United States, is you know somebody says that you know Sequoia gave me a term sheet at this valuation, um, you know your term sheet is clearly too low, and you can just more naturally have that price discovery mechanism rather than throw up all these ridiculous uh, arguments, which have to happen now and result in that sort of the, the, some of the. Uh, clashes that we're talking about between VCs and entrepreneurs. So I think part of it is just it, until the market gets more competitive, you know, we do need to think about clever ways to, to structurally, um, you know, align both parties. But, you know, in the long run, the healthiest thing will just be uh, more market liquidity. Okay. That, that's remind me with, uh, again, when we refer to Silicon Valley, I'm, although I, um, I'm not a big fan of comparing us to Silicon Valley, but I'm sometimes we have to use that terminology, we have to use the benchmark. So um, when I joined 500 Startups, I did a course in the first month with uh, Stanford and 500. It's, it was a two weeks course, uh, $24,000 about uh, secrets of Silicon Valley investing. So I went there, I did uh, the two weeks. My expectation was by the end of the two weeks, I'll be given like a formula. This is the entrepreneur, if he fits that criteria or she fits that criteria, this is the attraction, the number of download or whatever, and this is the valuation that you're gonna get. And then I realized that it is dancing more than, it's an art rather than science. Uh, and I was like, after two weeks, so the, the, the piece of advice we walk away with was, follow your guts. <laughs> and, and, and if you think that it's worth a million, then it's worth a million. And, and, and I was like, such a waste of time of two weeks. <laughs> Uh, but I agree. I mean, um, this is, it's, it's not easy to, ter to translate that. Maybe it's in the States is, is more of, of, of that since there are many players and many sure. buyers. But in here in the region, people want more concrete. They're not very, uh, I would say, um, uh, OK 
okay with with or comfortable with the fake uh, with the, the, the vague uh, valuations and, and translation but the vesting is 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 one way of, of doing it based on for performance based on uh, show off I can, I can if you don't mind I just add that one other thing <clears throat> one thing about valuations this is a piece of advice to entrepreneurs is don't walk to the investor and pitch them right if you want anything from anybody you know, even if it's your child, you start asking them what they, they want from you as, as well. Yeah. And, 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 and if you don't understand, what happens too often is, is an entrepreneur will meet with an investor, or me as the big investor, and, and I'll know everything about the entrepreneur at the end of an hour, and they'll know absolutely nothing about me. Uh, and, and really, the first meeting should be about, the, you know, the entrepreneur finding out what, what is it you want, how do you think. Because how do you start negotiating if you don't know what the starting point of, the, of, of your counterpart is? So that's just a piece of it. So invest in relationship? Sort of, yes. I mean, you, you, that, that's got to be part of it. I mean, you walk in and say, here you go. <laughs> this, is, this is it. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. Unfortunately, have you come across that uh, also example? Uh, look, a lot. But it's a, it's a, again, it's a function of the liquidity in the market, right? So um, I think... I think because there are such limited players and sometimes there are only maybe one or two parties giving you capital, you don't sort of diligence yeah. the investors as much as you should. Absolutely, you should know who you're getting into bed with. But what happens is you, it, there is a desperation on, on the entrepreneur's part in, in the region, right? So he's getting money from someone, he's gonna take it, right? Um, and again, th it's not the right thing to do maybe, but if it's your last resort, y you do what you have to do. Um, so as the liquidity again gets better, I think then people will be a little bit more discerning, right? But w what I think entrepreneurs should do is know their own value. I, I have a lot of meetings where numbers are thrown out with very little, I think, substance as to how you got to that number. You know, my, my evaluation is 25 million. Okay, how, how, show me how to get there. I'm not gonna say yes or no, uh, but show me how to get there. The, the story sort of falls by the wayside. So I think you should know and you should investigate what value your company is worth at that stage. And then have these discussions. At least you, you're mentally prepared for where you should be, uh, which I think is important. What's the piece of advice we can give entrepreneurs on that? How can they be comfortable with their value. Look, I, I, I tell people all the time, knock on doors. You know, you're at a stage in your career or your life where you started this company and you know a very narrow, uh, you have narrow expertise in, in your field or, or the product that you're building or the service that you're building. Talk to as many people as you can. Even talk to us. I mean, if, if, if you want to be mentored, uh, you know, it's okay to talk to the community and yeah. say, how do you guys look at things? And so you should learn how I think the investment community views valuation and views companies at various stages. Because the more you can educate yourself and the more you can surround yourself with people that can help you look at these term sheets, help you look at the valuation, you'll definitely get to the right place. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I know I'm an investor myself, but I get a lot of entrepreneurs that show me term sheets by others just to help them with the terms, and that's okay. You know, they know I'm completely not going to be involved in that deal, so they're happy to show me the term sheet, and I walk them through the terms, and, and that's fine. But I think you have to seek out that expertise. Zach? Yeah, I mean, you know, not too much to, to add to that. I mean, I, I do think, you know, even if you don't have too many term sheets, it's still important to know who you're getting into bed with. You know, sometimes you, if you literally take money that's so poisonous for your business, you'd have been better off shutting, literally shutting down your business and starting a new one rather than wasting two years fighting with your investors. So I agree that it's more relevant in a high liquidity environment where you have choices, um, but I think it's still relevant no matter what to get to know your investors. And if nothing else, it's tactical. It's a negotiating tactic. You know, the best entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley, when, I, when they would go to pitch me, it felt more like they were interviewing me, you know, than I was interviewing them, right? And if nothing else, kind of made me think, oh, these guys must be really good since they're giving me such a hard time. <laughs> I don't know if you guys watch the show Silicon Valley, there's a whole episode about that. Yeah. It's actually kind of true. Um, but yeah, I think, I think the reality is that, um, you know, the point about understanding where the investors are coming from is valuable as well. 
I think a lot of entrepreneurs would benefit uh, quite a bit from doing the portfolio math that the VCs have to do to understand what sort of risk return profile they're looking at and how that gets contextualized in your valuation, right? And we could go on a whole separate uh, tangent about that. Sure. Back to you, Subah, because I, uh, I got the sign that there are a few minutes left and I want to close with another important topic, which is the founder's equity. So we are in the region, and, and maybe you came across this uh, many times, we're not used to give that much of equity or to keep that much equity to the founder. Uh, how can we shift that? Because when I said that I'm moderating a, a VC session on ArabNet, everyone said, how can I convince the investor that to keep 80 or 70% <coughs> of my company when we go and, and negotiate? The, with, with the family groups, you can't. They're used to controlling 100%. <laughs> exactly. So, so, but I ha so I have a question. Who here knows who Samih Tuqam is? Put your hand up. Okay, you all should. He's the one who sold Maktoub to, to, you know him because he's a major founder of Karim. He sold Maktoub to Yahoo. He's, he's, he's a major investor in Souk.com, but you don't know him, right? He has, a, he has his own fund, no external money, his own fund called Jabbar.com. So the way you get the liquidity is to, first of all, find the liquidity that exists of professionals who understand these things and stay away from the family groups. Like I said, the family group, they have an agency, they have a special relationship with a special, and that's it. They're, they're, so they, why take risk? So, so if you don't know who Samih Taqan is, look him up, look up jabbar.com, and, and understand there's a lot more people like that, and you just got to mind them and find them. Uh, and, and that, I think, start is Start with the them, difference. get their valuation first, <laughs> knock their doors, exactly. uh, and then you start moving to the others. Exactly. And then end up with the family uh, yes. office. They'll come running afterwards, trust me. That's a, that's a good advice, actually. No, look, we're, we're, we're in a few discussions now where we're actually giving uh, the founder back uh, some shares. Oh. Yeah, so, so what happened was is they gave up a little bit too much too early. Yeah. And then I think once you bring in good investors who know sort of what they're doing and believe that the guys who are actually building the value need to have more of the equity, yeah we're giving that value back. So we're giving them back bigger ESOP plans. We're saying you need to top up a bit because they're the ones at the end of the day, day to day building the business. So, and again, given the nature of the market, you, ha you guys have to balance, I need funding versus growing my business and what do I need to do? But make sure that eventually you put yourself in a situation where you're clawing back some of that capital if, if you have to give up a little bit too much in the beginning. And the way you do that is by improving your investor base as you go forward. The more you bring in better investors, the more they're gonna understand that founders and, and the management team, frankly, not just the founders, need to have a lot of equity in the business. But giving back, that's not a common practice. No, unfortunately it's not. But unfortunately, I, no. we don't have case studies no. that can highlight that to the region. I, I personally believe uh, that this is important to the region. I Absolutely. came across one case in Endeavor where the founder was really having this much, like 10%. And even the found, when Endeavor wanted to select him, the number one comment was, it's too little. He cannot continue growing the company. And happily, the investors gave them back 15%, so he ended up 25. Yeah. Uh, but we need to highlight those cases more often. Uh, and I hope ArabNet can capture that as well. Uh, Zach, any last I mean, comment? If you have to teach an institutional investor about this, then it's the wrong institutional investor. So that's one thing. Now, we're talking about the family groups, the strategics, all these other um, types of investors. I agree it's about educating them. And I think now the good news is that you can point to case studies of companies. You know, I, I apologize if my perspective is a little bit Kareem-centric, but you can look at, you know, Kareem, where the founders, you know, really only had to give up a little bit of equity in every single round and guess what, you know, they were able to treat the business as true owners and scale it um, to the scale that we're at now. Had, you know, had that not occurred, that would never have been the case, right? If somebody had went and took like, you know, 50% right off the bat, I think. So I think the reality is there's starting to be examples that we can point to and it will become even more public when people crystallize their valuations um, in the public markets, which I'm sure will happen to, to various people in the coming years. 
But I think in the meanwhile, it's sort of like, look, this is how it's done. It's how it's done in elsewhere in the world, right? But it's also how it's done here in the region now, and it's where the, a lot of the biggest success stories have, have come from that model. Great. But the reality is institutional investors know this already. So Karim also did get some equity back, right? What's that, Equ equity back? Yeah. Of their equity back? No, 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 what I was saying is more just, um, we they were never dilute. forced they to give dilute. up they won't dilute. You know, an amount that was unreasonable. Okay, great. So that's another also case. We have time for two questions. Uh, I want to open the floor for the attendees, please. Uh, I think we can take one from here and one from the ladies section, uh, just to be fair. Hey, we are that good. We're answered. Any questions or? honestly not want to be among the first wave of companies that's raising from ICOs. Um, you know, Lumia's portfolio has a few companies that are looking into it now. And I think a lot of what we're learning is that this is uncharted territory. We don't know if you want to sell the company, if it's going to be possible to drag along the shareholders to make them sell too, who hold, you know, cryptocurrency, right, rather than traditional shares. So the reality is when you're talking about a legal structure that's this innovative and a method that's this innovative, you won't know for two years, three years, four years, five years what the real implication of what you're doing is. So I think it's very cool, it's very exciting, but I would much rather let other people figure it out and then follow them later. Uh, can we take the ladies' question? Any questions of the ladies' section? No? Then we have a question here, please. You mean startup to startup? So a startup from Middle East to a startup in Europe and US? It's a startup from the Middle East to the US. How do you do that? Sabah? Yeah. You, 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 you can do whatever you want, but if you want to be successful, I'd say no. Because the first thing that will happen when you say, look over there, your counterpart will say, what do I have to do with over there? Go get the, your money from over there. Yeah. I swear to God, because I've raised money also yeah. for, my, for my stuff. So you want to minimize moving out or creating anything that, that, that's new. You want to focus really on you and, and what you're doing. Because the minute you say, look over there, even if you say, look over there in the same country, they'll say, oh, thank you. Why don't I go invest over there? You know, that, that's, that's what I've seen usually happen. It's usually best to, to negotiate your own uh, so, Amjad? so I think I, I, my take is even in more mature companies, you take comps from, from global. But there's always an adjustment, right? Uh, if I look at a company in the U.S. trading at 10 times, it's a bigger market, uh, more sophisticated, margins might be different. So it's okay to take it as maybe a, 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 in your mind just as a data point but you're gonna have to make massive adjustments to the region and you know what the region offers in terms of market size, the challenges, and so on and so forth. So you know, I don't know how relevant it would be. Um, it, it's good for you maybe just to see the different data points of, of what others have raised in that industry, but I think you also need to make sure that you don't fall in the trap of saying, you know, that company's valued at 10 times revenue, so I should be valued at 10 times revenue. I mean, that, that's a 300 million people market. This is a much smaller market, so on and so forth. So be careful not to anchor yourself as well on a, on a valuation that might not make any sense. Great. With that, we conclude the session. Uh, please join me to thank our panelists, uh, Sabah Al-Bin Ali, uh, Amjad, and Zach. Uh, thank you so much for the insights uh, you. you shared with us. And Hope to see you soon. Thanks for attending us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.